In this video, I want to talk about stereographic projection. So this is a method for assigning all but one point on the circle to the real number line and vice versa. You could assign the real number line to every point on the circle except for one point. And this assignment is one-to-one, onto, and it's continuous. So sometimes you say that that is homeomorphic. And what's going on in the background here is this is a very basic example of a one-dimensional manifold and a chart for that manifold. So I've always been kind of interested in geometric things, differential geometry and algebraic geometry, though I've never really spent the time to learn it on my own. So maybe this is me dipping my toes into learning it on my own and making some videos about it. Okay, so anyway, let's see what we have. So I start with the real plane, so this is R2, and I have inside of the real plane the circle x squared plus y squared equals 1. So in other words, I have the unit circle centered at the origin. And we'll start by defining a map which will assign every point on this circle except for the north pole. So in other words, except for the point 0, 1 to a point along the x-axis. And that's going to give us a nice map from this circle minus a point to the real number line. Where we think about this x-axis is the real number line. Okay, so how is that assignment going to go? Well, it's going to go via a line containing the North Pole. So in particular, if we take an arbitrary point on the circle, like maybe we could think about this guy right here as an arbitrary point on the circle, then we could draw a line containing the North Pole and this point. So let's see, that line will look something like this. And that line will intersect exactly one time with the x-axis. And that will be the image of this point P under this map. So here, this is the input, this P point, which is on the circle. And this is the output, F of P, which occurs on the real number line. Now, let's see what's happening down here at the south pole, 0, 1. So if we make a line from the North Pole to the South Pole, well, that naturally crosses the x-axis at the origin. So that means this point right here is F of the South Pole, given that the South Pole is over here. Now, maybe let's do one more example before we start to write down formulas. Let's say we've got a point over here, which I'll call Q. So if we draw the unique line containing the North Pole and Q, That'll look something like this. So notice that goes through the x-axis right here. We would call this f of q. Okay, so suffice it to say, we have a way of assigning every point except for the north pole to the x-axis or to a point on the x-axis. And this assignment is one-to-one -one and onto. And as we'll see, this assignment is also continuous and differentiable. Now you might say, well, what about the North Pole? Why can't we assign that to some point along the x-axis using this method? Well, if we draw a line containing the North Pole and the North Pole, that's just a tangent line. But that tangent line will in fact be parallel to the x-axis, so it will never cross the x-axis. Okay, so let's see what we have. So we have the following map at this point. So I'll just say we have a map and it is called F. Well, we've called it F over here and it goes from S1, S upper one. That's the standard notation for the one dimensional sphere. In other words, the circle. So it's from S1 minus the North Pole, really just minus any single point because we could do a little bit of a rotation there. And then it goes to the real number line. And this is one to one and on to, which we haven't shown, but that'll be pretty clear once we get a formula. Okay, so maybe that's our next obvious question is can we find some like nice formula? And in fact, we can. 
So we'll do that by noticing that every point above the x-axis, in other words, every point in the northern hemisphere, can be rewritten with the following structure. This is of the form x comma the square root of 1 minus x. And I should point out here that x comes from the set negative 1 to 1, like that. So every point in the northern hemisphere can be written like this. Furthermore, every point in the southern hemisphere can be rewritten as the coordinate x comma negative square root of 1 minus x. And here we can take x to be in the open interval negative 1 to 1. Just so at the east and west poles, nothing like funny is happening with assignment two different ways. So that means in the northern hemisphere, we're looking for a line containing the North Pole, which has coordinate 0, 1, and P, which can always be rewritten with coordinate x comma the square root of 1 minus x, again, where x comes from that closed interval, but I won't write that down. So notice we're using this small x to mean the x coordinate on the circle. So I'll use capital X to mean the x coordinate like in the larger plane. So that might seem a little bit confusing, but I think in the end, it's not too bad. So in order to find this intersection point, which is really just the x intercept of this line, we'll find an equation for this line. That will start by finding a slope. And we'll just use like standard high school algebra to find this slope, the change of y over the change of x. So notice we've got the square root of 1 minus x squared minus 1 over x minus 0. So that's our slope. Great. But now we can use point slope form to write the equation of the line. So let's do that. So we have y minus the y part of one of the points on the line. We might as well use this coordinate. So it's y minus 1 equals slope, which is this guy right here. I'll simplify that a little bit. Square root of 1 minus x squared minus 1 over x times x minus the x coordinate on our point. But that's just 0. So I'll erase those parentheses and I'll just put capital X here. So that's the equation of our line. And like I said, what we're going for is the x-intercept. So the x-intercept is when y equals 0. So let's calculate that x-intercept. So like I said, it's when y is equal to 0, which means that occurs when negative 1 equals the square root of 1 minus x squared minus 1 over x times capital X. So we'll solve this for capital X. Well, what will we get if we do that? So capital X will be equal to, well, let's see, we need to divide this over, but then some signs are going to change because of this minus 1. We can just absorb that into this subtraction and flip the order of subtraction, leaving us with X over 1 minus the square root of 1 minus X. So that means we could go up here and write the image of this point P. So let's notice the image of this point P, F of P, is equal to little x over 1 minus the square root of 1 minus x squared. Okay, great. So now that we know what's going on in the northern hemisphere, let's do a similar calculation with what's going on in the southern hemisphere. So in that case, we need to look for the line that contains 0, 1, and x minus the square root of 1 minus x squared. So putting this together kind of the same way, we'll see that the equation of the line will be y minus 1 equals... 1 plus the square root of 1 minus x squared over negative x times our capital X. Extracting the x-intercept out of that, I guess I should say the capital X-intercept, we have capital X equals x over 1 plus the square root of 1 minus x squared. So we can take that as the equation for the image of points from the southern hemisphere under our map. So in this case, our example is built off of this point, which we called Q. F of Q is equal to X over 1 plus the square root of 1 minus X squared. Okay, nice. 
Okay, so now I think we've got enough information on the board to write down some nice closed formula that contains both cases. So we can summarize what we had on the last board with the following formula. So for a point x comma y on the circle minus the north pole, f of x comma y is x over one minus y where y takes the form square root of one minus x squared in the northern hemisphere and negative square root of one minus x squared in the southern hemisphere. Notice that's exactly the kind of thing that we have going on right here and right here. We're notice those two minus signs cancel to give us a plus sign. And I'll point out that this is continuous and bijective, but we won't check that. Okay, next thing that I want to do is maybe calculate the inverse function. So let's get to that. So we'll want a function f inverse, which goes from the real number line onto the circle minus the north pole. And it has to satisfy the condition that f composed with f inverse is equal to the identity. But that must be the identity on the real numbers whereas f inverse composed with f must be equal to the identity on the circle minus the north pole. That's because the domain and the codomain have different shapes, so we have to make sure that those identity maps are on the appropriate sets. Well, let's notice since f inverse goes from a one-dimensional space to a two-dimensional space, that means it has component functions. In other words, it'll take a point which I'll call capital X here, and it will assign it to a coordinate here. And we could call that coordinate little x, little y. So let's first impose this condition that f composed with f inverse is the identity on R. We're using capital X's for just this real number line. So that means we need the identity function, which is the function that takes capital X to capital X to be equal to f composed with f inverse evaluated at capital X. So let's notice that that is equal to f evaluated at little x, little y because capital X goes to little x, little y, and eventually we want to write those in terms of capital X, but we can't quite do that. And then that is equal to x over one minus y by what we have found for the formula for little f. Okay, but here we have one more point of information, and that is the relationship between x and y. Let's just assume that we're in the northern hemisphere to start with. I'll let you guys work out all of the details for the southern hemisphere as well. So that means we know y is equal to the square root of 1 minus x squared. So that means we really only have one variable over here, which makes it easier to solve for little x in terms of capital X. So let's see what we have now. We have capital X equals, so that'll be little x over 1 minus the square root of 1 minus x squared. And then from here, we'd like to solve for little x in terms of capital X. I won't go through all of the details. It's a fairly standard algebraic procedure. What you'll end up getting is some sort of quadratic function for little x in terms of capital X. You can use the quadratic formula. And what you will find is that little x will be equal to 2 times capital X over x squared plus 1. Okay. And then using this expression for little y, you'll see that little y is equal to capital X squared minus 1 over capital X squared plus 1. And that's happening if we're in the like I said, northern hemisphere, but in fact, the same thing happens in the southern hemisphere as well. So this works for both hemispheres. Okay, so let's maybe make a summary of this on the next board, and then we can move to another map where we leave out the south pole instead of the north pole. We just got done doing a calculation of a map from the circle minus the north pole to the real number line, and then we sketched a method for finding the inverse of that function. So we called that function f, and it was given by the formula f of xy equals x over 1 minus y, where x comma y lived on that circle. And then f inverse of x, so that takes a real number and puts it onto the circle 
where we've removed the North Pole, and that's given by 2x over x squared plus 1, comma, x squared minus 1 over x squared plus 1. And now, completely parallel to this, you can do the same game where you construct a map from the circle minus the South Pole to the real number line. So I've called that function g, and its inverse will be g inverse. And so how do we do that? Well, we make a line from the south pole containing our point P, and then look at where that intersects with the x-axis, and that will be the point G of P. So I've given an example over here and an example over here. So here, if we go from this point here up to this point Q, which is on the circle, then G of Q will be that intersection point with the x-axis. Then, doing the same kind of calculation that we had before, we'll get g of xy equals x over 1 plus y, where again, x comma y was on that circle minus the south pole in this case. And then I didn't calculate g inverse. Maybe that would be a nice homework problem just so that you guys have a feel for what's going on here. Now, we bring up a really important question and what is the agreement between F and G? So notice the vast majority of the points on the circle can be evaluated by both F and G. So in fact, all of them except for the North Pole and the South Pole can be evaluated by both functions. Now we'd like to see, do those functions agree? And maybe by agreement, I don't mean that they are the same value, but maybe I mean something a little bit fancier like if we pick a point on our circle, map it to the real number line with G, and then map it back to the circle with R, maybe that full action should be nice. Or if we take a real number and we map it to the circle with F inverse, and then map it back to the real numbers with G, maybe that composite function should also be nice. And that's what we'll check, that in fact, that composite function of doing that type of thing is nice in this case. So let's get a picture of what I'm talking about on the board, and then we'll make a calculation. Here's a bit of a sketch of what's going on. We can take the real numbers. We must remove 0. We'll talk about why we need to remove 0. Apply F inverse. That will give us the circle minus the North Pole and the South Pole minus both poles because we're interacting with this circle both with F and G. So notice it's with F inverse, which is really just F in the opposite direction, and with G. So F does not collaborate well with the North Pole, and G does not collaborate well with the South Pole. That's why we have to remove both of those. And then from this circle, we map via G to the real number line. So with this composition, F inverse followed by G, we go from the real number line minus the point zero back to the real number line minus the point zero. We cannot include the point zero here because G maps the North Pole to zero, but F doesn't interact well with the North Pole. We can't include zero here because F maps the south pole to zero and G does not interact very well with the south pole. Okay, so from here, I wanna make some color-coded observations just to see where portions of this circle map under these two maps and where portions of the real number line map under those maps as well. So let's start by maybe looking at this northeastern portion of the circle. And instead of thinking about where that goes via these formulas, we'll think about where it goes with just the geometry of our stereographic projection. So mapping backwards with F, because it's a little bit easier to think about mapping backwards with F, we will see that this northeastern portion of the circle will map to everything that is to the left of negative one. So I'll just like shade that in all in pink here. And why is that? Well, if you make a line from the North Pole to a point which is shaded in pink, it will intersect the x-axis to the left of negative one. So that's pretty clear, but you can draw a picture if you want to. Okay.
And then where does this portion map under G? Well, recall under G, we are looking for the line containing the south pole and our point. In fact, this point Q is a good representation of what's going on here. Notice that goes somewhere between zero and negative one. So here, we'll draw this shaded in pink here. And now let's move on maybe to the northeastern quadrant here. So that'll be points up here in the circle. So by a similar argument, if we map them with F back to the real number line, we'll land over here to points that are bigger than one. And if we map them to points over there via G, they will be between zero and one. Great, so that's what we have going on here. Now let's move on maybe to the southwestern portion. So that'll be between here and here. So if we map with G, we'll land between zero and negative one. So that's because we're looking for a line containing the North Pole and a point here, which is in orange. That'll intersect the x-axis about here, which is between zero and negative one. Then furthermore, if we do the same thing with the South Pole, we'll end up with something which is less than negative one. So we get something like this. Okay, so we have one more portion of this picture to fill in, and that's this southeastern portion. So that would be between these two points right here, maybe the eastern pole and the southern pole of this circle. Okay, so under our north pole stereographic projection, we're going to land here between 0 and 1. And under our south pole stereographic projection, we're going to land here between 1 and infinity. In other words, larger than 1. So that's the kind of picture we have going on here. So just to reiterate, what we're mostly interested in is our map, which is the composition here. So this would be G composed with F inverse, and that is a map from R minus the point zero back onto R minus the point zero, and hopefully that function is well defined. And this is a color coding of what it does. So it takes a point over here, which is to the left of negative one, and smashes it between zero and one. It takes a point here between zero and negative one, and it expands it out to a point between negative one and infinity. Then it does the same kind of thing for positive x values. Okay, so now let's get to a little calculation about actually what this function looks like. So we'll calculate g composed with f inverse, evaluated at x. Let's recall we were using capital X's for things over here on the real number line. So that'll be equal to G evaluated at, well, we had a formula for F inverse. It was given by this thing over here. So that's gonna be two X over X squared plus one comma X squared minus one over X squared plus one. Now we can apply G. Again, we've got a formula for G that could be derived in parallel to this formula for F, which we did derive. That will give us this X coordinate, which is two X over X squared plus one over one plus this Y coordinate. So that'll be one plus X squared minus one over X squared plus one. So we've got that complicated rational function. So maybe I would like to group everything in the numerator and everything in the denominator and then multiply by x squared plus one to make some sort of simplification upstairs and downstairs. So that'll leave us with two times capital X upstairs and then we'll have x squared plus one plus x squared minus one downstairs. So the x squared plus one comes from multiplying to this x, the x squared minus one comes from killing that denominator. But putting this together, we see that one minus one is zero, left, and we're left with two x over two x squared. In other words, we're left with one over x, which makes a lot of sense, because if you think about what the function one over x does as it maps the real numbers minus zero back to themselves, it does exactly what we've color coded here in this composition. It takes points between zero and one and it expands them out so that they're bigger than one. 
It takes points bigger than or equal to one and it compresses them down so that they're between zero and one. And it does the same thing to the left of the origin as well. Now let's notice that this one over x is most definitely a differentiable function on the real number line minus zero, which we could write in interval notation as minus infinity zero union zero infinity. And then maybe as a nice homework exercise, I think it would be nice to, instead of looking at this composition which starts and ends at real numbers, instead starts and ends at the circle. So maybe you would apply g from the circle to go to the real numbers, and then apply F inverse to go back to the circle and see which map you get out of that composition and if it's equally as nice. And that's a good place to stop.